Well, good morning, well. Uh, again, my name is Aaron Stritzel. It's great to be with you here <clears throat> today. I got a little bit of a cough going on. It's not COVID. I got vaccinated, I got tested, it turned turn out negative. So I'm grateful for that, but it's still lingering and it's awful to be out in society coughing a bunch and everybody's looking at you like, what are you doing here? Um, I just want to wear a tag that says, I don't have COVID, but I'm coughing like a bunch and it's okay. I'm safe, whatever. <clears throat> so hopefully it won't affect me too much. Um, today, as we continue on our sermon series, live well. Now, now, I think it's always important for us to engage. What does it mean to be a healthy whole, um, to live well? And, and my wife, who's a na uh, holistic naturopathic doctor, always reminds me that we are a web. Um, it's not just uh, about our spiritual or religious lives. It's about our mental, our physical, our emotional. And today we're going to talk about our relational lives as well. I think it's always important, but <clears throat> here's, here's the thing. I think it's more important now than it's ever been. And here's why. To put it really bluntly, it's not good news. I think it's going to get harder in our society before it gets better. I, I, I know... <laughs> I know if you're like me, you're like, oh, what? Give me some hope, man, because this is hard. The last couple of years have not been fun. Um, I think it's going to get harder. And, and I think a lot of that is because, yeah, we're going to navigate and navigating through COVID, but we still have politics. They're going to come back around. It's almost 2022, right? It's still going to be there. We still live in a, a, an increasing polarized world, but also... I think part of what it means to grow for us as a society is that we're gonna, things are gonna keep bubbling up and cracking through the surface. And of course, some people are gonna react to that and swing the pendulum one way or the other and not always healthy. But I think it's part of the process of what it looks like to become a society that's more just and sustainable in the future. Now, here's what that means for you and I. The invitation then is, especially as people of faith is, okay, how do we become a non-active presence, but where we can engage in that process, where, where we can engage in a way that's healthy. Um, <clears throat> a while ago, when I was actually at, in, in person there at the well, I talked about spiral dynamics and really this idea that there is a, a sort of wave of consciousness that's happening, that's more progressive, but you can, it can be reflected in healthy or unhealthy ways. And my hope is the healthier we are, the more healing and, and the more it pushes and in, not pushes, but invites everybody up instead of making people feel bad for not being up to par or up to whatever, using the politically correct language that we can invite people into that process of healing and growth together. So that's why I think it's important. Today, we're going to talk about relational well-being. We're going to do so not so much in like a, a linear kind of outline, but more think of it at the core, which the simple, the core message today is relational well-beings are essential. Absolutely essential. I would argue the, the core essential part of our lives. And then we're going to talk about it from biblical and psychological and research and, and biological as well, kind of why all of these things point to the fact that our relationships are the core healthy relationships are the core to our overall well-being. Again, interconnected with everything else, but I think they're absolutely essential. So scripture, Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Now, I grew up in an evangelical setting where this was used primarily in what we called accountability partnerships, which was a super intense partnership between two people uh, where we would ask each other all the hard questions that you wanted to ask. What did you look like at the, on the computer? Did you look at a, uh, a person lustfully? Did you act in pride? Did you lose your anger? All that stuff. It was looking back, not a lot of healthy, positive connotations to this passage. So, but here's the thing and why I kind of brought this up right in the beginning is I, I'm all about deconstruction. I think we need to create spaces where we can deconstruct. But I'm also becoming more aware of, of um, how easy it is to get stuck there. How easy it is to step back and become cynical and sit on the sidelines and just complain about church or politics or uh, the world, everybody, <laughs> right? Like how easy that is, especially right now. 
And I think what we need is spaces to do that, but people to guide us towards a healthier reconstruction, a way of rebuilding. So what does it look like? <coughs> There's my cough for you. Um, it looks like taking this text and saying, okay, what does this mean? Well, it means that personal, intimate, healthy, close relationships are absolutely essential for us. That th there's wisdom in that. Um, and that relationships um, affect everything else. And in fact, most of our problems stem from relational strain, don't they? Now, I'm willing, if you look at your problems in your life, most of them have to do with relationships. I mean, we have work relationships with a boss or coworkers or employees or customers or clients or patients, right? Those affect every part of our lives. Uh, we have family relationships with a spouse, um, a loved one, uh, kids, grandkids, grandparents, extended family, aunts, uncle, cousins. We have <clears throat> relationships, uh, friendships, people we do things with, um, relationships and organizations that we're a part of, whether that's church or nonprofits or schools, wherever else we might interact or volunteer. <coughs> um, relationships, kind of our whole life centers around relationships. Here's the thing, there's been research done by Barna, and here's a, a, a slide here, that statistically pre-COVID, that over 50% of US adults had some sort of emo emotional mental health issue that impacted their most important relationships, that, that over 50% were struggling with at least one relationship. So I'm gonna invite some interaction here today. If you're watching, you can get next to the computer because I'd invite you to interact, to type yes, uh, if this makes sense. And I know I'm not there in person, but I hope you'll interact and, and raise your hand, mostly for everybody else to see, because um, I think it would be interesting. But I have a couple, a few questions actually. My first question is this. How many of you have had a strained relationship this past year? Raise your hand. Type in the comments, yes. <clears throat> Hopefully if you're watching, you can see other people type. If you're in the room, look around. How many people have had strained relationships? Now, here's a second question, digging a little bit deeper. How many of you have had a strained relationship that's an, a close, some, something you would say would be a close relationship. Would you raise your hand or type yes? How many of you have had a strained relationship in a close friendship in your life over the past year, year and a half? Raise your hand. I'm right there with you, by the way. Now third, how many of you, you can put your hands down, how many of you have had a strained relationship and more than one close relationship in your life over the past year, year and a half? Raise your hand or type yes in the comment section. Look around, keep your hand up. First of all, you're not alone. But second of all, note, reflect, become aware that most of us have had multiple strained relationships for people close in our lives. So for me, my spouse um, and I navigated um, working remotely. So we. All of a sudden we found ourselves both working at home and then we found our kids doing school at home and then we found our, us trying to teach them how to do school at home and trying to figure out how to do seventh or sixth grade math and relearn that and then our son's like if you guys don't know it what's the point and i'm never going to use this and we're like yeah you are even though we're thinking maybe you won't but still got to use it right um or learn it right <clears throat> so there's all those strained relationships and then if you have families you, you had to engage probably in some sort of mask war of like, do our kids wear masks and do they go around other kids who do or don't wear masks and how do you understand that? Then, then okay, family. Most, all of my family is on the uh, different uh, side of the political aisle and doesn't see things the same way theologically. That has caused a lot of strain, a lot of strain. Perhaps you're one of those as well. And then work. I mean, if you had to change jobs or move remotely, or like us, you moved through a different state, <coughs> how much those changes have strained work relationships, at least to some extent. Those are just a few examples of so many more we could probably give. All of that to suggest that we're probably experiencing more strain in our relationships than ever before, for most of us, ever before in our lives. And I'm willing to bet that the strain is high for all of us. And relationships affect all parts of our life, even one strained relationship. So if we have a strained relationship at work, we come home, 
we kind of bring some of that energy with us, don't we, right? Uh, if we have it at home and we go to work, same thing. The Bible from the very beginning is interesting. In Genesis when we have this, this creation story where God creates a human. And then over time says, oh, it's not good for this human to be alone. And then from there on, the rest of the entire Bible is all about relationships. How do spouses get along, right? What happens when you can't have kids and you want to have kids? What happens when you have kids and now you're siblings? How do you get along with siblings? How do you not fight and argue or kill each other, literally, right? Like, and then how do you create healthy tribes and societies and structures? And how do you get along with people who believe or think differently than you? This is the arc of the Bible. It's all about relationships. Jesus, <coughs> which we've heard before, I'm sure, when he was asked by a lawyer, what's the most important command? Said this, basically, your relationship a healthy relationship with the divine, with God, and then your healthy relationship with others. Those are the essential things. How you relate and understand and experience God and how you relate to everybody else. That's what matters. That's what it means to be a Christian, by the way. It's not just first and foremost, do you believe the right things? It's how do you live in right relationship with the world? Especially through the lens of in the life of the teachings of Jesus. So we see this scripture, but we also see this uh, psychologically. If you've ever heard of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, perhaps, uh, we'll throw an image up here that shows, just to recap. First of all, we have our basic needs, right? Our, we, we need water, food, rest, shelter, those basic needs. And then we have psychological needs, belonging and love. That is the next thing that we need after our bases are covered. We all fundamentally need belonging, love, relational connectedness. In fact, we know this from research. Brene Brown, who uh, I think you can see probably, I have like a half of a bookshelf here of Brene Brown books, <coughs> one of my favorite authors of all time. She didn't set out, I don't think, to do this, but she researched hundreds of thousands of people and, and learned, yes, she's known for shame and, and profound ways that has shaped my life incredibly, but here's the thing that, I don't think a lot of people realize that what, what her research has done is communicate what is most important to the human condition. What gives us meaning and purpose in life? So a quote that's probably my favorite quote that you've probably heard before if you've been around me much is this, where Brene Brown writes the following, we are biologically, cognitively, physically, spiritually wired to love, be loved, and to belong. When those needs are not met, we don't function as we're meant to. We break, we fall apart, we numb, we ache. The absence of love and belonging always leads to suffering. And I would, I would add the, the most horrific kind of suffering. If you've ever endured that, which I can guarantee you have if you're over the age of, of three <laughs> and you're watching this, that you know what it's like to have a, a, an intense strained relationship. It's hard. It leads to suffering but we are wired for love and belonging. In fact, quite literally, biology, let's look at biology, specifically the way our brain is shaped, right? And we, three parts to our brain, the prefrontal cortex, but what, what was interesting for scientists for so long was the size of our brain is quite large compared to our, our, our physical makeup. If you look at the rest of the animals, we have elephants who have a larger brain because they're bigger and you have mice who have a smaller brain and they're smaller, right? I mean, it was shaped on sort of their physical size, but humans don't share that. In fact, we have the largest brain by far based on our physical size. Why? And it was um, it confused scientists for years until the work <clears throat> of Robin Dunbar who suggested this and now it's pretty widely accepted that our brain, especially the size of our knee, uh, prefrontal cortex, suggests that it is larger so that we can engage in social uh, relationships, in a larger social, social circle, all right? That's why uh, we're wired that way, literally. We, our brains have been created that way so that we can engage in wider network of relationships. Fascinating. But here's the thing, <clears throat> part of what also strains these relationships is 
the, how mobile our world is, our culture, especially in the U.S. I, I mean, we move more than at any other time in history, predominantly for jobs. And by the way, as somebody who's moved too many times in the last six or seven years, uh, I can attest to this personally through experience. When you live in a place for only a year or two, it is hard to develop deep, lasting relationships. Why? Because we all know relationships take time. You connect through experiences. You grow together. You, you, you don't just trust somebody the first day completely with everything, right? You get to know them. You share. You develop this ongoing exchange. It's banter, this fun. You get to go out and experience different things, right? So we live in a society that is more mobile. In fact, here's a question. How many of you would raise your hand and say, I'm, I'm not originally from Phoenix? You're watching. I, I moved here. I wasn't born in this area. How many of you would say, I, I moved here? Raise your hand. Now look around. Look at how many people are not from this area, picked up and moved from somewhere else, right? Does that affect our relationships? You betcha it does. Absolutely. So drawing also from other forms of research, uh, if you've ever heard of a study called the Harvard study, it's a study in adult development. Uh, if you've heard of it, it's probably from a TEDx talk in November of 2015 given by a man named Robert Waldinger. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend just afterwards go and find this. It's worth it. It's 15, 20 minutes maybe. If you've watched it and it's been a while like it was for me, um, rewatch it. It's actually incredible. But what they did is they studied men. First of all, men, they not too long ago in the past few years <coughs> introduced women. Uh, to the research as well, but they studied over 700 men from young little boys onward. And they studied their physical, mental, um, cognitive, emotional, everything. They studied and trying to get like, what is, what makes a person healthy? What gives them meaning? What gives them purpose in their lives? Um, and here's what they found. Through it all, they found three things. Number one, probably the most important thing, social connections are really good for us and loneliness kills. In fact, it was social connections that determined whether they were healthy or not, more than anything else, the relationships. And also found that when you're not socially connected, when you feel isolated, especially as your age increases, your health declines. But that's true wherever we're at, that when we feel isolated, as Brene Brown said, we suffer, right? Um, so all of this kind of pointing back to this idea that we're, emotion, or we're relational beings, that relationships are at the core of everything else that we do, right? So the, the second thing that that study found, it's not the number of friends you have, but the quality. Do you have those intimate, close friends that you can be vulnerable and honest, who will support you through all the ups and downs of life? Those are important. The third thing it found is good relationships don't just protect our bodies, they protect our brains, as iron sharpens iron. So relationships keep our brain sharp, especially as we age. This, this was like the number one determining factor, healthy relationships. Even more so, as, as big of a fan as I am about healthy eating and exercise, even more so is healthy relationships, that it's at the core of everything else. In fact, it, it kind of drives all these other aspects of our life. So um, I, I've been wrestling with the importance of church lately. Um, <clears throat> I've been in conversations with people and seeing a lot of unhealth and not just unhealth too, but COVID happened and pastors were already stressed and struggling. And now they're navigating this whole other sphere of people can't gather and it's not good to gather in person. And now we're doing online stuff. And now we're post some of that and people aren't coming back and they're not volunteering. And all this stuff is adding extra stress and tension. And <clears throat> I was actually just, um, visiting a, a church in North Carolina and I was talking to a, a, a pastor out there who was more of a church planter and he's like, man, we started in 2018 and, and had a good group and then COVID happened and, and that was fine and now we're coming back, but it's not as many and I'm struggling. Some people are leaving and I'm like asking myself, what's the point of all this, right? Like we're sharing and I, I'm right there. Like what is the point? And, and but here's where I come back to <clears throat> and what, what I found inspiration and hope from. Really, it comes from the book of Acts. I want to read you a text, Acts 2, 32 through 47, which says this. <clears throat> Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. 
they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much of their time together in the temple, they broke bread at home, ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and, give, and having the goodwill of all people. When I think about this, it's actually brilliant. It's genius. Like, if you're going to create a movement, especially if you want to create a movement of health, well-being, that is a more just and generous way of living in the world, it has to be through relationships. There's just no other way to bypass that, right? It has to be relationships. It has to be people saying, I want to live a different way and I'm going to do that together in community. And this is why it's important that you don't just show up for the well. That once you find that this is your place, that you invest in it. It's messy. Perhaps you have hurt from past experiences of church. I get that. You're not alone, by the way. Most of us here have, right? You're not alone. But here's the thing, is that if we want to bring change in the world and we want to live healthy lives, it's only going to happen in community. I mean, this was quite fascinating. Jesus gathered people together and, and broke bread with them and lived with them and shared with them and did life with them. And then the only reason that movement continued after he died is because they had an experience of something post-death we call as Christians resurrection. It was like, hey, we experienced Christ alive in us. Let's embody that in the world. And they gathered together and they ate meals and they broke bread and they worshiped and they were formed by love for the sake of the world. And they went out and sought to live a different way. Recently, I was reading a meditation by one of my favorite authors, Richard Rohr, and he was talking about how Jesus didn't just confront um, and deconstruct and, and point out all the wrong. In fact, what he did even more than that, occasionally he did that, right? He flipped tables, right? But more than that, he gently began to cultivate a different way and invited people into a different way of living. Materialism. I, I look at the rampant, um, really the religion of today, materialism or um, <clears throat> promotion, right? Greed, wealth, whatever that is. How do we confront that? Yeah, we can point out that or we can say, we're going to begin to live a different way and cultivate communities where we don't buy into that system. We, we see through that broken system and we live differently, right? Kind of back to that whole point of, uh, of not just deconstructing, not just being another cynical person on the sidelines, throwing whatever, throwing tomatoes at whatever, right? But how do we cultivate healthy communities? I mean, that's what uh, the well is about. That's what we're trying to do here um, and other places are trying to do that. How do we cultivate communities? We know people have been hurt by church. We know that religion messes up. We know that even Christianity fails and has failed in multiple different ways. So do we just throw it out? We try, but then what? Well, you still got to live your life, right? You still got to find healthy relationships in some way. Some people do that, but I still think that a church, a healthy church community is one of, if not the best ways of going about and doing that together, of investing. So it's not just about showing up at the well, but it's investing time and money and resource and saying, I believe in this. And, and this is actually the way that people find healing. We know we heal together alongside of others. When people can be vulnerable, when people can find love and belonging and acceptance. Jesus called it the kingdom of God. In the Greek, it's basileia theou. Basileia just means a geographic area or a region or political area. The, the area of God in seminary, my, one of my professors wrote a book, Jesus is Abba, and he talks about Basileia Theu. It's God's kingdom, or we might translate it commonwealth, or I might even take it a step further and say community, God, where God's community abides, where, where God's presence can be felt, where justice is had where people are loving and giving and serving each other. What if this core teaching was not just talked about, but embodied by you and I? Sure, we've seen it. Yeah. Richard War says the best criticism of the bad is the practice of the better. What if people like you and I committed to saying we're not going to just deconstruct but we're going to keep practicing this and find better ways keep trying because we really believe 
that the way of Jesus gives healing and hope to the world. It begins with you and I. It begins in these relationships right here. Like Brene Brown said, she basically sums it all up this way. Connection is why we're here. We are hardwired to connect with others. It's what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. Without healthy relationships, we don't have purpose and meaning. Healthy relationships is what gives us purpose and meaning. So I want to close today with, with uh, the first practice this week. Is there um, a broken relationship? Is there someone you can reach out to? A relationship that's been rocky. That you can begin to repair that. You can send a text or make a phone call or ask to take them out to coffee or something. Uh, you lost a temper. You, you, you were too angry. Maybe you pushed your opinion too much. Maybe something just doesn't feel right. Is there some relationship in your life that you feel like, ah, I wish, you know, this person comes to mind. Would you write their name down and, and commit to reaching out to them sometime this week? Second thing, are there relationships that you need to create healthy boundaries around? Some people are toxic and you need to limit your time with them. Some people drain you. Some people you maybe should never be around, quite frankly. Now, don't go to them and be like, hey, you're toxic and I'm not going to be around you. Probably not helpful. But we might have people in our lives that we find when we interact with them, they push us, uh, they drain us, we feel tired, we feel exhausted. Um, whatever that looks like, you might need to put time on it, like an actual physical, like, hey, you know, I know, keep it to yourself again, I know, and maybe share it with your spouse, but I know I can spend 30 minutes on the phone and if I push it too much longer, I, I just get agitated. That's okay. We all have different personalities, we all have different ways of doing things. Healthy boundaries create healthy rhythms. Then we're less likely to react, we're less likely to be unhealthy. So we could have done the whole thing on boundaries, to be quite frank. Just know and feel okay to put those healthy boundaries. So who are those people in your life, family or friends or whatever, and put those healthy boundaries and say, oh, I need to limit myself and my time with them. And that might be ongoing. You figure out as you interact with them, oh, yeah, actually those are people that drain me, right? Those are people that, that require a lot from me. The third practice is this. Can you reach out to those three or four people who are most important in your life? And let them know that you value their relationship. Let them know how important they are to you. Maybe it's been a while. Maybe it hasn't. But just let them know, hey, you know what? Uh, you're one of the, the few, you're, you're, you're one of my closest friends. And I want you to know that I value your friendship so, so much. Right? Reach out, give them a phone call, text them, take them out for coffee, whatever it is. Because we need to be intentional about those things. It's more than ever before. Um, intentional about those relationships. Would you bow your head and close your eyes as we close our time with prayer here? God, Trinity, relational oneness. At the core, the universe is relationship. As Christians, we believe God is relationship. And we are invited into that relationship to give, to receive, and to give. God, help us to have healthy relationships. Now, to help set up healthy relationships that will keep us healthy in the future as we continue to navigate um, a changing world and things that will trigger us, things that sometimes um, invite our uh, reaction, things that stress us out, things that we wish we didn't have to deal with, um, so many things. God, but we recognize here today as we gather how important relationships are. Would you help us mend or take steps to mend any relationship? Help us practice that and to help us create healthy, healthy boundaries, knowing that, that you actually want us to create those healthy boundaries. And three, help us to continue to pour into and cultivate those close friendships because we recognize that those quality of those close friendships are what will be most important long-term in our life. 
God, we thank you that we had this time as we reflect on our life here going forward. We ask for your grace to be with us all as we continue to stay, take steps out in a, in a crazy uh, world. Help us to become more healthy, more like you. In your name we pray.